I welcome you all to the house of the Lord this morning. May his grace, mercy, and peace be the portion of each and every one of you. Bulletin this morning, we do have a reminder that there will be a woman's conference, which will be taking place in October. It's actually on October 1st, starting at 9 a.m. all the way through to 4 p.m., and that's going to take place in Westminster, California, at the Orthodox Presbyterian Church there. The primary lecturer will be Eileen Scipioni. You may be familiar with Skip Scipioni. He was a very well-known nephetic counselor in our circles. He was used of God mightily to help people overcome many deeply rooted problems in their lives. Well, Skip recently entered into glory, but his wife is still here, and so she's going to be a lecturer, and she's going to be speaking on the topic of friendship and hospitality. But along with her speaking as the primary speaker, there will also be some breakout sessions. And so Katie Novinger is going to discuss discipling our covenant kids and Sherry Wagner, who of course is the wife of Roger Wagner, a very seasoned veteran of the Lord in our denomination. She's going to be speaking about gracious words. And then Eileen Scipioni in a breakout session is also going to be speaking about intimacy in marriage. And so the ladies are going to gather to study the Word of God, but also to pray together. And it's free. If you'd like to attend in person, you can do that. If you want to watch online, you can also do that. But they do ask that you would register for that. Now, another thing today is that over the next two weeks, we are going to be gathering up diapers and food items for the pregnancy center. So we're going to have a box in the back of the church. If you would like to join together, you could speak to Melba about what exactly the pregnancy center is going to need. But you are going to be receiving, first of all, an email. So please read that email about how we're seeking to bless those who are stemming the tide of abortion in our nation. But along with the email, over the next two weeks, you're also going to be receiving in the bulletin an insert that you can read. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us to be a blessing in our own generation as we stand against the horrible atrocity of abortion in our nation. Well, if you would, please stand for our call to worship today. It comes from Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. And those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Well, let's remain standing as we sing a hymn that was written in 1745 by a Welshman named William Williams. It's entitled, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. This indeed is a prayer of humility. It is an acknowledgement that you and I should never try to guide ourselves, but we should lean with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength upon the infallible revelation that God has given to us in his life-giving word. Let's turn these beautiful words into the sentiments of our souls as we pray and sing together. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
God said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our glorious God, how we thank you for the privilege of entering into the presence of the Most High God who has promised to be our guide even until the days of our death when we pass from this life into everlasting glory. Our Father and our God, we bless your holy name for your ancient people Israel, and we thank you for that instructive journey that they took as the blood of sprinkling was given to them. Our Father, on the night of their redemption, you unleashed your power upon the Egyptians. The nations of Israel, indeed, were blessed richly because of the sprinkling of the blood. And our Father, it is because of that great redemption that your people began that pilgrimage through the barren land. Our Father, we too are pilgrims upon the face of the earth. We also have been sprinkled with the precious blood of the Lamb that cleanses us from all sin. And so, our Father, I pray that as you were the faithful guide of your ancient people, you would guide us, each and every one, through the wilderness of this world with all of its snares and with all of its temptations. Our Father, we desperately need your guiding hand to be our blessing and our portion. Father, give us attentive ears as we hear the precious word of life today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work with transforming grace within our souls. And I pray, our Father and our God, that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. For we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Since we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning, which is all about the grace of God that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to be reminded that a part of that grace is being instructed in the way that we should live. And that means, of course, that the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, known as the Decalogue, is very relevant for us today. John Calvin describes the way that we're going to be using the Ten Commandments as those who are already saved as the third use of the law. Now, in my sermon today, we're going to be concentrating for a time upon the first use of the law. The primary purpose of God's law is to show us our sin and to lead us to a Savior. But God's law is also given to curb evil in society. And then thirdly, according to John Calvin, and correctly, God has given us the Ten Commandments, his holy law, to guide us in the way that we should live. And what we're going to be doing is reading from the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, and then showing that the, uh, the apostles used the very same commandments and application to a life of a believer in the New Testament. Okay, And so the Ten Commandments, then, are a faithful guide in the way that we should show our love for God and for one another. I'll begin, if you would follow. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You 
You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Well, you and I should be doubly com convicted today, not only from the Old Testament, but also from the words of the New, and certainly as we consider the depth of teaching and instruction that's contained in the Ten Commandments, each one of us has been nicked and scraped and reminded of our sinfulness and need of a Savior. And so this is the time that we come together, we join our mouths and our hearts together as we confess our sins before the one whose very name is holy, who inhabits eternity. And so, brothers and sisters, let's humble ourselves before the Most High God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. O Father of Jesus, help us to approach you with deep reverence and joyful faith, not with presumption or servile fear. Give us holy boldness and confidence that you are our faithful, covenant-keeping God, and that you cannot abandon or reject us. Forgive us, Lord, for we are not faithful followers of you. We confess that in religious duties, our lips and our feelings of our hearts have not always agreed. We have frequently taken your name carelessly on our tongues and trampled on your kindness with our many sins. We have desired and pursued things that would injure us and have despised some of your chief mercies. We have harbored sinful hopes and fears, and we confess that we are unfit to choose for ourselves and direct our own steps. Like Esau, we are quick to exchange the glorious privileges of our birthright in Christ for the fleeting delights of sinful bodily pleasures. How can we ever thank you for your faithful patience with us, your very unfaithful children? Father, forgive us. The assurance of our pardon today comes from Isaiah 55, the most evangelical of all of the prophets, incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. Well, with this, we are going to be singing once again, Jesus Calls Us, number 591. He tells us in John chapter 10, his sheep hear his voice, and the way that you and I hear his voice is by recognizing that he is speaking to us infallibly and lovingly from the pages of Holy Scripture. And so let's be reminded of the pleasant call of our Savior to love him and to serve him as we turn from our evil ways. Jesus calls us number 591.
Lord Jesus Christ is not only calling us from the love of this world, but he's also calling us to the throne of grace at this time, and so we are going to be uniting our hearts and voices once again. Now, not in confession, but in acknowledgement of the tremendous mercies that have been lavished upon us through the grace of our salvation. And so today we are going to be thanking the Lord that he has heard our prayers for missionaries to go to Uruguay. Now, through the years, we have been praying for the Richline family, who have been missionaries in Uruguay for many years at this point. In fact, some of us went over to Bayview, I think it was last year, to listen to Mr. Richline, Mark that is, as he told us about the mission work in Uruguay. So we've been praying for other missionaries to hold up their hands, you remember? And so the Lord has heard our prayers, and the Lord is sending now the Payson family to be a blessing unto the rich lines in Uruguay. And I'd like to read a very short uh, section of an article in the recent New Horizons magazine. These are free, by the way. They are very helpful devotionally for your family. And the wife of Stephen um, is named Catalina. And I'm going to read you a little bit about her life just so that you can see the wonderful working of God's providence in the life of this woman and this family and how the Lord was preparing them many years ago for the very blessing that they would be to the Richline families in Uruguay. I was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and was educated in a Roman Catholic home where going to Sunday Mass was an obligation. We never missed worship. I developed a relationship with Christ while attending a convent school in the 5th through 7th grades, even though there wasn't a road to Damascus moment. At recess, I would go to the chapel to talk to Jesus, and I realized that I had to find a way to serve him. I thought that the best way to serve him was to become a nun, but I cried myself to sleep every night at the prospect of entering a convent. Fortunately, my mother told me that I was not called to be a nun if the idea made me cry that much. I owe this convent school a lot for introducing me to the Bible. In the seventh grade, I was asked to read through the Bible, even though by the end of the school year we had not finished it. I continued reading it during my summer vacation. I have a hard time not finishing a book, and I'm glad that this habit of mine spilled into reading through God's Word. As a young adult, I fell in love with Stephen, who, as an unbeliever, proceeded to question my faith. I have grown as a Christian since then. However, my growth would not have been the same if God had not turned toward him turned me toward himself, the heart of the man who became my husband. We were able to grow together, supporting and encouraging each other as we grow together, even today in the ministry. I still have a long way to go in my Christian walk, and I'm looking forward to my further sanctification. My husband has been interested in missions ever since he started to travel to Uruguay to help establish the mission work there. However, at that time, we did not feel called to the mission field. And so she's going to be ministering to many Roman Catholics in Uruguay, and so the Lord was forming her and shaping her for the very position that she would have, and how we praise God for his grace and mercy that he lavished upon this couple and their children, who now will be serving the Lord in Uruguay. So we're going to be seeking God's blessings upon Stephen and Catalina. Let's pray together and seek the face of the living God. Our loving Father of mercy, oh, the depths of your riches, how unsearchable are your judgments and your ways past finding out. Our great and our gracious Father, these are the very words of the inspired Apostle Paul when he considered the way that your providence works in the lives of your ancient people Israel. And even as he considered the coming blessings that they would receive as they are united with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, by coming to a saving knowledge and a true belief in the Son of God, even Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Our Father, we would offer you the very same doxology this morning. For you indeed are a God whose handiwork is very clear in the life of Catalina and also of her pastor husband whose name is Stephen. Our Father, we thank you today that you are the great hearer of our prayers. Our Father, we have asked for an open door for other missionaries to be sent down to Uruguay to bless Mark Richline and his wife as they serve the kingdom there. 
And our Father, we thank you that as you stirred the hearts of your ancient people Israel, so you have stirred the hearts of people in this family known as the Patience. And our Father, you're sending them down to South America, to Uruguay, to be a blessing to those who are letting their light so shine before men. Our Father, we thank you for the union of the spiritual saving light between the Rich Line and the Payson family. I pray that this light would radiate with clarity, with power, with saving health. And our Father and our God, that you would use these holy families mightily to be a blessing, even an everlasting blessing to many people who will be united to Christ through the saving testimony and the faithful proclamation of the truth that is there. Our Father, we thank you for the testimony that we have heard about our sister Catalina this morning. And we thank you, Lord, that although she was raised in a Roman Catholic context, in that context she was encouraged to read the Bible for herself. And so, Lord, she has become a trophy of your grace. And although there is so much false teaching and even deadly heresy amongst the Roman Catholic Church, we recognize that your word is so powerful when it is blessed effectually through the influence of the Holy Spirit, that you can call people from the north and from the south and from the east and from the west. No matter what their context or hindrance might be, your word is of such power that it can convert a soul and bring them to saving faith in the Son of God alone. Our Father, this is what you have shown us through the testimony of our sister Catalina. Our Father, I do pray that your blessing would be upon her. And I thank you, Lord, that you say about her what you have said about many others. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fires? Our Father, by nature and by choice, we are all children of flame and of fire. For we are all children of wrath because of our rebellion against the love and grace of our God and Father. And yet, our Father, we thank you that through the grace, even that sovereign grace which reaches down and opens up our eyes and gives us fear within our souls and faith within our hearts, it is because of this sovereign grace that you rebuke Satan as he seeks to accuse us. For we are all, as we are saved, brands that are plucked out of the everlasting fires of condemnation. Father, for this we do give you praise this morning, and I pray that you would help us to lead others to the very same glory that we have enjoyed within our souls as we first trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our Father and our God, we would pray not only for our foreign missionaries, but Father, we thank you for the way that people in this congregation are seeking to be missionaries on the home front. They are indeed remembering the very call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we sang those beautiful words this morning, Jesus calls us, and we thank you that as we read the word of God, we do hear the voice of our great shepherd speaking to us in that still small voice, saying, Christian, follow me. And our Father and our God, we are mindful of that gracious invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Our Father, this is our deep longing this morning, that we would truly fish for the souls of mankind. Our Father, we pray for all of our parents here this morning, that they would be diligent and wise fishermen for the souls of their children. I pray that our parents would be able to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, on the day of all days, on the day of judgment, saying, Here am I and the children which you have given to me. Our Father, I pray not only for wisdom and persevering grace for our parents to be fishers for the souls of their children, but Father, I pray that you would enable our children to listen to the wise encouragement of their parents. Help them to be wise unto salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and help them, Lord, to seek Christ while he might be found. Even during this day of grace and of salvation, I pray that they would yearn for him and put their faith in him. Our Father, we know that the Spirit must be poured out from the heights of heaven if this will become a reality. And so we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon all flesh. Lord, you have promised to pour out your blessings upon our seed and your Spirit upon our offspring. May it be so for each and every one of them as they come to a saving faith in the Son of God. Father, I pray for those who do not have children but are still being faithful and scattering the good seed of the word of God to friends and to family members alike. 
Our Father, I pray that although they scatter the seed, I pray that through the Spirit of God that seed would be watered, that it would indeed germinate within the souls of those who are hearers, and that it would spring forth and bring forth an abundant harvest of salvation and righteousness to the glory of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, we again need your blessing upon us if this will become a reality. And so, our Father, I pray that you would use us mightily in the days to come to be winners of souls and to be fishers of men. Our Father, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in turning many souls unto righteousness and to help us, Lord, to be faithful in warning people about the pathways of death. For we know, Lord, that as we seek to be winners of souls, you have promised us that we will shine like the stars forever in the heights of heaven. And I, Father and our God, I do pray that you would enable us to inherit this blessing at the second coming of the Lord. For our Father, this indeed is the blessing that we desire. And that means that we must be urgent and faithful in the days that you have given to us here below. Help us, Lord, to work the works of him who sent us while it is day. For we know that night is coming when no man can work. May it be so for each one of us. We ask all of these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to be singing How Shall the Young Direct Their Ways, number 148. We'll remain seated for all of the stanzas apart from the last. How Shall the Young Direct Their Ways. Just a reminder, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we take up a second offering known as the deacon's offering, and that's used to be a material blessing to those who are in need in this life. So at this time, we are going to be singing the doxology together. ties and these offerings. Our gracious God, we thank you that you have moved in our lives already so that might we might give with generous hearts for the extension of your kingdom. Our Father, I pray that as we give, you would receive, that your Holy Spirit would bless, and that your word would run and be glorified upon the face of the earth. Our Father, we ask that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted high and exalted so that he might become the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords for thousands, even millions of people. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'll turn over to Genesis 19, and we'll take up our reading in verse 18. We'll read through to the end of the chapter, which is verse 28. Genesis chapter 9. Once again, we'll take up our reading in verse 18, and then we'll read through to the end of the chapter as we do so. Please remember that this is the inspired and errant life-giving word of the Most High God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word abides throughout all eternity. Therefore, please listen with loving and submissive hearts. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, for those of you who are taking notes this morning, I'm going to give you a brief outline of what I'll be covering here today by God's grace. We're going to be considering as our main theme the importance of showing honor unto whom honor is due, according to the revelation of God. And as we do so, we'll see that we're called then to scan the surface of their lives. That's the first point. Second point will be that we have to consider the currents of their lives. And then thirdly, we're going to be descending below the water line. We're going to be sinking below the surface of the water to consider deeper realities in the lives of those that we're called to honor. So let's show honor to those to whom honor is due according to the word of God. And let's pray and seek the blessings of the Lord upon the proclamation of the truth today. Our glorious God, we thank you that our Savior is the one who loved us and freed us from our sins by his own blood. We thank you that along with making us a kingdom of salvation, he has also called us to be priests unto the God of all grace, that is to serve him in the act of worship. Now as we do so, we acknowledge that we can only come before this high and holy God whose very name is holy through the mediation through the righteousness and through the glory of Jesus of Nazareth, who is our Savior. And therefore, to our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, deserves all glory and all dominion. May it be so as we call upon your name and as we learn from your holy word afresh this morning. For we ask all of these things in our blessed Savior's name. Amen. Since living here in San Diego, I have grown in my appreciation for men and women who are called to be lifeguards. And I'm sure that you have had the opportunity as San Diegans to observe those who are called to that very calling. And therefore, you recognize that very often lifeguards are situated very high so that they can scan the surface of the ocean looking for people with flailing arms or people who might be carried under the waves of the ocean. And of course, as lifeguards are called to scan the surface of the ocean, there are times when they leave their elevated position 
they jump on a long surfboard and they paddle out into the waves of the sea. And I remember a number of months ago, one of the lifeguards in Coronado paddling out on his red surfboard. And as he paddled out about a hundred yards, he said a large fin popped up right alongside of him. And there was a 12 foot great white shark that was immediately next to his surfboard. Now this lifeguard recognized that this great white was about 12 feet long because his board was 11 feet long and this great white shark was about a foot longer than the board that he was on. I certainly have grown in my appreciation for those who are summoned to be guardians of life upon the ocean. But when you study what lifeguards actually do, you'll learn that they not only scan the surface of the ocean, but they also consider the currents that are before them. And I remember standing on a beach with my children and hearing the call of lifeguards for anyone who was in the ocean to get out of the ocean immediately, and they explained that a rip current was being formed, and they didn't want anyone to be dragged out to their death by the strength of this rip current. And so along with scanning the surface of the ocean, they also consider the currents that are forming that could be very dangerous to those who are enjoying the briny waves of the sea. But even more than all of this, you may recognize that lifeguards also have to understand something of what's going on below the surface. And here in San Diego, as you walk the beaches, you may have an opportunity to see yellow signs that are situated across the beach, reminding you that there is indeed a high level of pollution in the water at that time, and so it could be dangerous to your health if you spent too much time in the ocean. They need to know what's going on underneath the surface. And some of us have probably seen people sitting next to lifeguard station with their feet in buckets of water. And the reason for that, of course, is that they've been stung by a stingray. And lifeguards recognize that what needs to happen at that point to dissipate the pain is to put the feet inside very hot, even scalding water, which supposedly helps to alleviate the pain that they're suffering from the sting of the stingray. Now, all of this is to underscore this morning the reality that I have grown in my appreciation for people who are called to be guardians of the ocean. Now, as a minister of the gospel, I am somewhat like a lifeguard to your souls. But this morning, I invite each and every one of us to be like a lifeguard as we consider the warning that God has given to us in a very godly man whose name is Noah. Now, what we have this morning, then, is the conclusion to the account of the flood narrative. In verse 28, the final verse of our chapter, we're told that Noah lived 350 years after the flood. Now, we've already been informed that Noah was 600 years old when the flood took place. And by the way, the days and the years that you read about in the book of Genesis are the same days and the same years that you and I have in our own generation. We're twisting, we're mangling the word of God if we understand days or years to be any different than the days and years that we have now. Yes, people at the dawn of creation lived a very long time. And we're informed that Noah lived to be 950 years old as an indication of approval, a sign of God's love and blessing upon Noah. We're about to consider a solitary stain upon his record, but in the very final verse, God is saying, despite his sin, I love Noah and I approve of the life that he lived before the eyes of a watching world. But we are indeed informed about that solitary stain, that ugly blotch upon the record of this godly great man of old. And so what you and I then are going to do this morning is three things. We're going to scan the surface of the sins that are mentioned. Secondly, we're going to consider the currents that flow into and out of the lives of those who are sinning here. And then finally, we're going to sink below the waterline, and we're going to be reminded, I hope, that our sins are much worse. They are a much greater tangled mess than you and I might realize at first. And in seeing this reality, you and I are going to be driven afresh 
to the only one who never sinned in thought, word, or deed, to the only one who was perfectly, invincibly consecrated to the service of his heavenly Father, and that, of course, is our representative, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, this morning, I would like us to scan the surface of the sins that are mentioned. And as we look at our text here today, we're told in verse 21 that Noah drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Now, you and I should be shocked in our spiritual sensibilities. You and I should be jarred within our souls when we're told that this godly man whose name was Noah, which means rest, a beautiful type of the Lord Jesus Christ, fell into the egregious sin of drunkenness. Because from Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Revelation, the word of God warns us about the sin of drunkenness. Now let me be clear here. The Bible does not forbid the enjoyment of wine or of intoxicating spirits. Psalm 104 is very clear that God has given wine to make glad the heart of man. And the Lord Jesus Christ even enjoyed wine in his own generation because he was called a glutton and a wine-bibber, which means that he would have been drinking in moderation, not to excess, and so there's nothing wrong with enjoying a little bit of intoxicating spirits very carefully. But when we're told that Noah was drunk, it means that he was inebriated. And not only was he inebriated, he was so smashed that he took off all of his clothes. And he was there stark naked for eyes to see. Now, brothers and sisters, the Word of God has a lot to say about the danger of drunkenness in our lives. We can think, for instance, of Proverbs 20, verse 1, which teaches us, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now we're being told here about the outcome of drunkenness. If you want to make a clown out of yourself, if you want people to mock you and to laugh at you and to ridicule you, remember, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is even worse. Strong drink is raging. It brings out the beast. It brings out the animal within our souls. And therefore, whoever is deceived by the raging mocking of strong drink is not wise. And the Proverbs are all about living a life of wisdom. And one thing that we should understand as we study the testimony of the Proverbs is that they give very clear warnings about the sin of drunkenness. We can think, for instance, of Proverbs 23, verse 31. Look not upon wine when it is red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. At last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. So what Solomon is saying here today is that you have to be very careful that you're not bewitched by the beauty of the red wine that you're not intoxicated by its spirit. Because if you are, you will find that in the end it brings pain, it brings misery, it brings suffering to your own body, but also to those who are around you. And so if you want to avoid the serpent that stings and the adder that bites, do not overindulge in intoxicating spirits. And in fact, as we turn the pages of the New Testament, we find that the warnings are even more clear because they underscore not the earthly sorrow, but the everlasting misery of those who give themselves to a life of drunkenness. Paul is describing the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. In verse 21, he warns us about envyings. He warns us about murders. He warns us about drunkenness and about orgies. And Paul goes on to say, What I have told you before, I will tell you again. Those who do such things, who live this kind of a life, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're given to drunkenness, you need to repent of that sin and acknowledge the shame and misery that it will bring into your life and into the lives of many other people who are around you. No, I believe that this was not an ongoing sin in the life of Noah. 
I believe, as many of the commentators, that this is a solitary stain upon the record of this holy man of old. But he certainly did succumb to the horrible sin of drunkenness, where he stripped himself naked and remained in his tent for other eyes to see. But notice then, as we consider this first point, scanning the surface of sins that are involved, that we have not only the sin of drunkenness, but also the sin of dishonor. For we're told that one of the sons, the son whose name is Ham, entered the tent of his father and saw his father's nakedness, and then he went and he told his brothers about his father's nakedness. Now on the surface, it doesn't mean, it doesn't appear to mean that there's really that much of a sinful attitude or behavior here. But when we read between the lines, we find that there is indeed a very egregious sin that's being committed against this holy man who is now becoming a clown as he shames himself with the horrible sin of drunkenness. The word for see in our passage often means to gaze upon something diligently and with the greatest interest. It means to study something as to discern what it's all about. We know that because seven times in the opening chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter 1, we're told that God saw seven times. And that means that God is studying, God is gazing so as to discern. He saw the light, that it was good. He saw the division of land and sea, of day and night, that it was good. He saw the tender herbs and the green grass and the majestic trees, that they were good. He saw the creatures of the field and the beasts of the earth and the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air. And again, we're told in Genesis 1 that they were good. And it's not until he comes to the creation of mankind, the apex of his creative handiwork, that he said, behold, it is very good because man is created in the image of God. What's the point, Pastor? Well, very simply, the point is that when Ham gazed upon his father's nakedness, he didn't avert his eyes. He looked as to study the nakedness of his father. And there are all types of conjectures about this. I'm not going to get into them today. He should have looked away from his father's nakedness and horror. But instead, he gazed, he gloated, he studied his father's nakedness with a joy within his heart, and he immediately ran out to tell his brothers about his father's shame and his father's disgrace, the very thing that he should never have done. And so this indeed is a very grievous sin that we have before us today. It is the sin not only of drunkenness in Noah, but also in dishonoring parents in Ham. And children, no matter what age you are, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, if you have parents, the word of God is crystal clear that you are to honor your father and your mother, for this is right. And God gives us the assurance of blessing to those who honor their parents. In fact, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, is the very first of the commandments that's given in the context of a promise so that your days might be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And yet when we turn to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul applies the very same promise to those who are children of Christian parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And Paul mentions Ephesians 6, verse 2, that this is the first commandment with promise, that it might go well with you, and you might live long upon the land. You see, there are earthly blessings for children who honor their parents, who refuse to disgrace their parents by scattering abroad or gossiping about the sins of their parents, unless it's absolutely necessary in order to overcome those sins. The Lord Jesus Christ also reminds us not only of the blessing but of the curse of those who dishonor their parents, Matthew 15. Do you remember our blessed Savior and his disciples were engaged in an itinerant ministry? And as they were preaching the gospel, calling upon souls to repent and to receive the kingdom of God, the Pharisees came to Christ and his disciples. Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? 
That's what their concern was. Not the law of God, not the fifth commandment, the traditions of men. And so the Lord Jesus Christ flips the coin over and he responds with a question. Why do you transgress the law of God with your traditions? For God has said, honor your father and your mother. And the Lord Jesus Christ goes on to quote from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9, which says, If anyone curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. Now to bring this into perspective, the word for curse there is not to rip your parents up and down with all sorts of expletives and horrible things. It's to speak ill of your parents. It's to have a heart and attitude of disrespect to your parents. And if this is applicable to the whole human race, how much more should children who have Christian parents love their parents and honor their parents, even as we see taking place in this passage of God's word? There are blessings, but there are curses for those who are either obedient or disobedient to the fifth commandment of God. It's a pillar of the world. It is a key to a life of blessing before the eyes of the Almighty God. How do you respond when you hear about godly people falling into very grievous sin? As a very young believer, some ministers that took me under their wing invited me to attend a yearly pastor's conference up in Montvale, New Jersey. It was a Reformed Baptist conference where the preaching was really, really good. And so I would go up every year. And I remember before one of the conferences, I heard that we should be praying for one of the ministers that we all knew about. A very godly man. He raised a godly family. He was a great preacher of the word. And so we were told that we need to pray for him because he was kidnapped. He went down to Dominican Republic and someone stole his credit cards and no one could find this godly pastor that everyone knew about. And so we were, we were praying. We were pleading with God that he would be found and that he would be kept safe. And so I arrived at the pastor's conference and as the conference began, knowing that many of these pastors were praying for this one individual man, we were informed that this pastor was not kidnapped but he fell into very grievous sexual sin in the Dominican Republic. As a young believer, it was as if somebody took their fist and sucker punched me right in the gut. I didn't see it coming. All the wind was taken out of me. My heart was shattered, and I cried. That was a good lesson, but I cried. And brothers and sisters, when you see a godly person, maybe your mother, maybe your father, falling into very grievous sin, it can happen, you know. It happened here in this text. I hope you don't gloat and rejoice. Oh, this is my godly mother or father, huh? This is what Christianity brings, because what we're going to see in a moment, that's exactly what the wicked do. And that's exactly what this man whose name was Ham did in his own experience. So we're scanning the surface of the sins that are mentioned. Now let's consider the currents that flow into and out of the sins that we're considering. Now I would remind you as we do this that in chapter 6, verse 9, we're told something very important about Noah. We're told that Noah was a just man, that he was blameless in his generation, and that he walked with God. God? Why was he saved from the overwhelming flood of death and destruction? Because he was a believer, and his believing is described as him being a just man. Now, to be a just man or woman means that your life, generally speaking, is a life of conformity to the law of God. That is the primary concept of righteousness. The primary concept of holiness is consecration. The primary concept of righteousness is conformity. And so Noah lived a life of humble faith and service to God. But even more than that, when we're told that he was blameless in his generation, it doesn't mean that he was sinlessly perfect, as we'll see in a moment, but it does mean that his testimony was clear, that his testimony was resilient, and that his testimony before the eyes of a watching world was devoid of scandalous sin. 
And so he was a man of conformity. He was a man of clarity. But when we're informed that Noah was a man who walked with God, what the Spirit is teaching us is that Noah was a man who lived in intimate, loving, sincere communion with the God of his salvation. Very clearly, we're dealing with a regenerate, born-again individual who lived a very, very godly life. And so when we see Ham then, looking with an eagle eye, being so critical and so joyful over the sin of his father, it means, of course, that there's something scarily, is that a word? <laughs> scarily wrong in the life of this man whose name was Ham. It means that he was not a lover of God or of his father. Pastor Joe, how do you know that? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 6 tells us that love rejoices not in evil. If you and I have true faith, we have true love for God and for each other, and that means that our faith is going to demonstrate itself by being grieved instead of joyful when we see a child of God falling into egregious sin and rebellion against their heavenly Father. And even the Apostle Peter warns us in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, the end of all things is at hand. And so he's teaching us how we should live in light of the nearness of the coming of our blessed Savior in the clouds of heaven. And he tells us a lot of things in 1 Peter chapter 4, but in verse 8 he says something which is very, very instructive. The end of all things is at hand, Above all things, love one another deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. Love does not rejoice in the sinful fall of others. True love, according to people, uh, Peter, is a love that will cover a multitude of sins. And so children, when you see your parents sin, and your parents are going to sin, because we all sin, and the Word of God teaches us explicitly that there's not a just man upon earth who does good and sins not. Now when you think about what Solomon is saying there, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20, you might think to yourself, well, what good is Christianity if there's not a just man upon earth who does good and sins not? I believe what Solomon is saying in that context is not that there's not a just man, it's not that there's no one who does good because we were already told that Noah was just and that Noah was doing good things. But what Solomon is really getting at is this. No matter how just you are, no matter how good you might become, there's not a single person on earth who does not sin apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I need to be prepared for sins in great people. And you and I also need to be prepared to recognize, even as Psalm 137 teaches us, O oh Lord, if you were to mark iniquity, who could stand? If you were to keep a very careful record of our sins and hold them against us, no one could stand before you, Lord, because every single person, people and pastors alike, sin every single day that we live. This is the humbling declaration of the precious Word of God. Think about it for a moment. The Holy Spirit of God Himself has seen fit to record this ugly blotch, this crimson stain upon the record of this great man whose name was Noah. Why is that? Well, I would simply remind you as you seek to answer that question, that God has seen fit to record the crimson stain, the ugly blotch upon the record of the greatest men who have ever walked the earth. Let's think not about Noah for a moment. Let's think about David. If you ever trace out the life of David in First and Second Samuel, you're going to be on the sidelines cheering for this guy. He's a young shepherd boy. Everyone else is shaking in their boots. They refuse to stand before this blaspheming Philistine. And then you have this little shepherd boy with a sling. Who was this blaspheming giant to blaspheme the name of the Lord of hosts? And this little shepherd boy sinks a stone right into the head of this blaspheming giant. 
Woo, go David. And I can go on and on in the life of David. All of these events that he endured to the glory of God because of his faith in the Messiah. He had to hide in caves. He had to live in the podunk city of Ziklag in the middle of no man's land, living as a desert pirate, raiding the wicked people who were around him just to provide for the people who were his followers. But you know, when you get to the end of David's life, with everything that he accomplished, all that he endured to the glory of God, for some reason, it ends not as Americans like stories to end, on a note of joy and triumph, but a note of tragedy. David numbered the armies of Israel. He grew prideful within his soul. He started to lean to his own understanding. He knew that he was forbidden from numbering the armies of Israel, but he commanded Joab to do that very thing. And because he did that, the Lord sent a destroying angel to wipe out thousands and thousands of those who were his own people. Noah's sin, David's sin. How about Moses? Pastor Joe, are you really saying that there is a blotch, a stain upon the record of Noah that God recorded? That's what I'm saying. The first time that the nation of Israel desperately needed life-giving water, God said to Noah, I want you to stand before the nation with your rod in your hand. I want you to strike that rock, and the waters are going to gush forth. That rock is a picture of the one who is the rock of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, who only needed to be crucified, smitten by the law of God, one time. But there was another occasion when the nation of Israel desperately needed life-giving water. But this time the Lord said unto Moses, I don't want you to strike the rock. I want you to speak to the rock, and the water will come forth. But Moses was being provoked to anger by those who were murmuring and complaining and whining and carping. Do you ever find that you're enticed to sin? Because people in your life are complaining and carping, and they're never happy, and they're moaning, and all the rest of it, and you get provoked to anger, and you do the very thing that you know you shouldn't do. You blow your stack. Moses blew his stack, and in so doing, he struck the rod a second time. God, in his grace, sent the water out of that rock a second time. But because of that act, which was an outburst of anger, God said, you're not going to be the one who enters into the promised land. Joshua is going to be the one. And by the way, that means by way of type that you're not going to get to the promised land of everlasting glory through the laws of Moses. Only the true Joshua, whose name is Jesus, will lead you into the promised land. Moses is there to lead you to Joshua, and Joshua, who is Jesus, will lead you into the promised land. I could go on with this this morning. But beloved, what I'm trying to show you is this. Not only as we scan the surface do we see certain sins like drunkenness and dishonor, but we see that this man who fell into the sin of drunkenness had a current in his life. That was the current of faith and of godliness, of obedience and of joy. And if he was able to be overcome by sin and temptation, how much more should you and I be on our guard? Even as the Lord Jesus Christ said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is very, very weak. Be on your guard, folks. Very good believers in Jesus Christ can fall into horrible sins. Now, thirdly, I'd like to show you then that we need to sink beneath the water line. And my purpose in doing this with you today is to remind you that the only hope that any one of us has is the perfect, spotless righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I want to use the law to convict you of sin. But as I do so, I want you to hear what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth might be stopped and all the world might become guilty before God, so that we would see that no one will be justified through the works of the law. 
Paul says. So we might nick, we might scrape, and as I do so, I'm going to be reminding you that each one of us, if we truly understand our sin, each one of us is so much worse, so much more of a tangled, disgusting mess than we realize if God left us to ourselves. Let's focus for a moment upon Noah's sin of drunkenness. Do you think drunkenness is a sin that's committed in isolation? If you add the pin, drunkenness, upon the tail of the donkey, and what I mean by that is pin the reality of drunkenness on one of the Ten Commandments, which one would you pin it to? might be that some of you would say, well, I would pin it to the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not kill, because the, body, or the Bible teaches us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so clearly then, if you're committing the sin of drunkenness, you're harming the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're guilty of the sin of murder, and you would be correct. In fact, anything that you do to harm the temple of the Holy Spirit can fall under the Sixth Commandment. It might be that you would say, well, you know, I'd kind of pin it to the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, because repeatedly we see in the Bible that the sin of drunkenness is linked together with the sin of sexual immorality. And so Noah, in our passage, was not only inebriated, but he took off all of his clothes and he laid down naked in his tent. Could be that you would apply it to the Seventh. How about to the Eighth Commandment? Thou shalt not steal. Are you stealing when you get drunk? With 100% accurately accuracy, I would tell you yes. We just learned in chapter 9 last week that God is jealous for his glory. And we learned that the reason that God has given the prohibition of man killing man is because man is created in the image of God. God wants you to shine forth in spirituality, in rationality. This is what it means to be created in the image of God. But when you become inebriated, what you're actually doing is eclipsing the glory of God. You're becoming like a beast. And so you're robbing God, committing sin against the eighth commandment of the moral law. Are you committing sins against the ninth commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Are you and I called to be image bearers of God? If you're drunk, people are going to look upon you and say, look, not only are you an image bearer by birth, but you're also an image bearer by salvation and grace. Is this what your God is like? A brute beast? A drunken clown? You're bearing false witness against the God of your salvation. Are you coveting? With a little thought, I think that you would see that you are. And I only touched on the second table. I could show you from the first table that you're also breaking every one of those commandments. You're starting to get a flavor of what sin is really like. What a tangled web we weave when we practice to deceive. You could put any sin at the end of that sentence, and you will find that it is one gigantic, tangled mess breaking all the commandments of God. How about Ham? Was that a simple sin against the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother? Well, it was against the fifth commandment. But I could also walk you through the commandments and show you that he was actually breaking every single one. And at the root of his rebellion against his father was his rebellion against God. Brothers and sisters, you and I are tasked with showing honor to whom honor is due. The Apostle Paul gives us this admonition in Romans 13 in a context where he reminds us that the authorities are God's servants. Therefore, Give taxes to whom taxes are due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due because of your faith in God. Which means that if you're living in disrespect to those who are in authority over you in this world, 
Your real disrespect is not toward a human being. Your real disrespect is to God. And that's the very thing that the Apostle Peter teaches us in 1 Peter chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 17, when he said, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God. If you truly want to honor people who are in authority over you, you need to fear God. And if you're not honoring people who are in authority over you, you don't fear God, at least not at that time in your life. And so we think about children honoring parents. We think about wives honoring their husbands and being respectful and being submissive. We think about citizens honoring those who are their political leaders with all of their spots and wrinkles, and we know that they have them. Beloved, we need to put a bridle upon our tongue and be careful with our words, although we are discerning with what's happening in our nation today. So what we're seeing then is that you and I are like lifeguards. And when we consider the sin that is before us, we scan the surface and we see simple sins. But when you see sin in the life of a believer, I invite you to stand back and to consider the currents that are there. And we're going to be considering the cursings next week. And as we do so, I think we'll find room to praise God for the general tenor of the life of godly men like Noah. Let's pray. Loving God, be with us today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is indeed at work within us. Help us, Lord, to remember that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. At this time, we are going to prepare for the Lord's Supper. I'll invite the elders to come forward. I'll read the words of institution for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that I'm, to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Forward here. So what is the life of Noah all about sacramentally? Are there any lessons that we can learn in the life of Noah about what we're about to enjoy in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? Well, absolutely there is. You remember in our previous study, I hope, that God gave a sign to all of creation that he would never again destroy the world with a flood of water. As long as the earth remains, God said, there will be summer, there will be winter, there will be heat and cold, there will be springtime, there will be harvest, there will be day, there will be night, four couplets. Describing the beautiful and peaceful harmony of the created order until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this shall be a sign to you, God said. It is the rainbow. And we learn that the word for bow in that context is the exact same word for a battle bow. You know, that has a string and people set an arrow upon the string and they launch it. It's as if God is saying, I'm laying aside my weapons of war. What I'm doing is showing you that I am a God of goodwill who desires the best for you. As the rainbow starts upon the earth and ascends into heaven, there is a way for human beings who also start on earth to ascend into heaven. And according to Revelation 4.3, the throne of the Son of God not only has an arc of a rainbow, but it's completely encircled by the rainbow, which is a sign of God's compassion and mercy. If you want to ascend from creation to heaven, from this earth to everlasting joy, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the very simple lesson that we learn, but it is a sign, the rainbow. 
which means that it is a type of a sacrament to the human race. But along with that, I would remind you today of what the Apostle Peter said about the waters of Noah's day, even the waters that destroyed the earth during the days of Noah. Listen to this interesting description. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And then he goes on to say, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's hard to understand exactly what Peter is saying there. But what he's saying clearly is that the waters that flooded the world bringing death symbolize the reality of our baptism, spiritual baptism by the Holy Spirit. What do you mean, Pastor? That's a big concept to wrap my head around. It is. The waters of Noah are a symbol of the spiritual reality of baptism in this way. The waters cleansed the earth of evil by bringing death. When the Holy Spirit enters into a human soul, he cleanses that soul by enabling that person to die unto himself or to herself from trusting themselves, from living the life that they once lived. And as Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, Peter goes on to say, you and I die through spiritual saving baptism by the Spirit, and we begin a brand new life, which is a resurrected life, a life which is lived to the glory of God. In other words, there's a lot of sacramental theology in the Bible about Noah and the flood that took place in his day. God wants us to have signs, visible pictures of his grace. And he wants to explain those signs so that they would become seals, confirmations of the grace, mercy, and salvation that he offers to us. So this is a sacrament of the Lord Jesus Christ, known as the Lord's Supper. And this is not for people who are living in scandalous sin, Pastor, what happened if I committed a sin like Noah? I would ask you not to refrain from the Lord's Supper, but ask you this question. Have you repented? Have you humbled yourself before the bar of God's justice? Have you cried out for mercy and asked that the Lord would blot out your transgressions? If you have repented, come to the table. But if you're living like the sin that we had recounted, either in the life of Noah or his son, Ham, don't come to the table. Because 1 Corinthians 11 also teaches us that before we come, we have to discern the body and the blood of the Lord. We don't go through an empty routine where we just train that this sacrament is about. It's about salvation from sin the legal consequences, but the experience and power of sin too. And it's not for children who haven't entered upon years of discretion, who don't really understand what the bread and the fruit of the vine are all about. So there is mental discretion, spiritual discernment, a sensitive conscience before we come to the Lord's Supper. But if you recognize your brokenness, your need, you desire to believe in Christ, he is saying, I'm for you, but you're also for me because you are a consecrated vessel in my hands. And so on the same night in which our Savior was betrayed, he broke the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat.
partake in faith. On the same night in which our Savior was betrayed, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All of you drink from it. Take in faith. Let's pray. Loving God, how we thank you for the sacrament wherein you condescend to the weakness of all of your people. Lord, you have given us the audible word of the gospel today, but you have also spoken to us by way of our eyes and our other senses, the sweetness of the fruit of the vine, the nourishment of the bread. May we all participate in the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we all be consecrated to his service and love and in worship. For we pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, And Can It Be That I Should Gain, number 455.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.